Okay, so well, thank you so much for having me here this morning. I'm really excited to talk to you today, particularly as it is Rosh Chodesh Azar. It is the beginning of the Jewish month of Azar, a time when we say that we increase our joy. And I'm hoping that this morning in our brief time together, we can explore a new angle on joy, a new way of building and experiencing more joyfulness in our lives. So a few years ago, there was a YouTube video that went viral. It showed a young girl, maybe four or five years old, in a ballet class. And it was one of these recital videos, right? You can see that like shaky hand, the parent is taking the video. And there's a classroom full of girls and they're in their cute little pink leotards and pink tights and tutus. And the teacher is taking them through some very basic moves. Now there's one girl who is completely out of sync. All the little girls, the teacher reaches up her arm, they reach up their arm. She reaches up her left arm, they reach up their left arm. And then there's this one little girl who seemingly cannot get her feet to lift. And when the teacher reaches one way, she sort of clumsily reaches in the other direction. Now this might seem tragic, but what was delightful was this little girl's almost lack of embarrassment about this, right? You might imagine if you were there, you'd be having a whole commentary in your mind. But here she was just being her. And there was something sweet and delightful about this. Now, I have to tell you, I was actually shown this video in a neuromotor class that I was taking as part of my occupational therapy training. And it wasn't shown to us in the context of, oh, this is going to be so delightful. It was actually shown to us to demonstrate dyspraxia, a motor learning deficiency or difficulty. And it was being shown in the context of a young girl who clearly couldn't motor plan, that the teacher was showing them one movement and her lack of capacity or certainly barriers in executing the moves. Now, you might feel like you have two left feet on the dance floor. You might feel like the dance floor is your place. Regardless of where we find ourselves on that spectrum, I think we all can relate to what it feels like to be on the floor of our lives and to see certain moves, to want to engage in certain behaviors, actions, experiences, and to feel like we can't quite get the move right. Yes, I'm not alone. Okay, so on one end of the spectrum, we have this girl who is clumsy and, and the darling of YouTube in her ballet performance. Now, in my occupational therapy training in another course, a theory course, we were shown another video clip. And this one was from the movie Billy Elliot. Any Billy Elliot fans out here? Yeah, okay, all right. So the story of Billy Elliot, right? A young boy said in mid-1980s UK coal miner strike. Billy Elliot is being raised by his father, Jackie, a new widower. And his father's a coal miner who's on strike, as is his older brother. And you have this young boy in, in England, mid-1980s, and his father is on strike, scraping it together, trying just to raise this kid as best he can. And he takes Billy to the local gym, where there's a boxing class, right? He's going to teach his young boy how to be a man. Billy does not exactly take to boxing. Okay. Now, what happens, though, is Billy hangs around the gym. And when his boxing class is over, he sees that the gym has been rented out by a ballet teacher. And he watches this class, and he is completely mesmerized. You see this boy's eyes light up. There's something drawing him, certainly not the experience he had when he was boxing. And he begins to watch, and she invites him into the class. And it's very clear, very quickly, that Billy Elliot has, has a real talent for ballet. Now you can imagine, in a small coal mining town, that a boy as a ballet star to this widower is not exactly his dream of the boy he's going to raise. And when Jackie, Billy's father, finds out what he's been doing hanging around these ballet classes, he forbids him. But after some time, series of events, I'll give you the synopsis, it becomes very clear to Jackie that this is his son's joy, that this is his son's source of meaning, that this is what Billy Elliot needs to do. Now remember, this is during the coal miners' strike. So Jackie decides that he needs to figure out a way to support him. And in fact, this teacher has suggested that he go to London to audition for the Royal Ballet Academy. So Jackie does what a devoted father would do. He tries to scrape together the money. And the only way he can figure out to do so is to try to cross the picket line. But he stopped. But the townspeople find out why he was trying to cross the picket line. 
And they all band together, they raise money, and they send Billy Elliot off to London so he can audition for the Royal Ballet Academy. He gets in. The film ends 15, 14 years later. It's Billy Elliot. He's the lead in Swan Lake, and he's leaping gracefully across the stage. I was shown that clip to demonstrate a concept called flow. Csikszentmihalyi talks about this idea when we're doing an activity and we are completely sublimated in the doing. We lose a sense of self. Now, you might not be a professional ballet dancer, but likely we've all had times where we are so engaged in what we're doing and feel such a love and connection to how we are moving through the world, who we are with, how we are building or working, that even for a moment, we lose that sense of self. We are completely subsumed in what we are doing. Now on one side, right, we have Billy Elliot. This feeling of complete flow, of I'm in it and, and I'm myself and I can perform, I can be. The other end of the spectrum, we have this sweet little girl clumsily dancing in a ballet class. At different points in our lives, honestly in different points of our days, I think we shift between these two roles. There are the moments where we are soaring. There are the times when we feel connected and like, okay, I got this, I can do this. And then, just like that, same day, same moment, same self, we can feel like that clumsy girl who can't quite get her feet to do what she wants them to do. Now, we know that both realities are true and that our work is not to disown either experience not to privilege one above the other, but to figure out how to move ourselves closer to the kinds of actions, to the kinds of doing, and the kinds of being that we want. Because that flow, that moment, when we leap across the stage of our lives and we feel, yes, this is me, this is who I am in the world, is the most joyful experience that we can have. And the body, the doing, the actions in our lives, will be actually the most powerful tool that we have. Martha Graham says that the body says what words cannot. That in the world of action, we communicate sometimes far more deeply than any concrete words. So in Judaism, we think about the body often as divided into three components. We have the head, the mind, which represents the intellect, our thoughts. We have the body, which houses the heart, the seat of emotion. And we have the feet. The feet are the world of action. The feet are the world of doing. The tool that carries me beyond myself and steps into the world of, of accomplishing. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you just have that amazing insight, right? Likely we all have had it. You're inspired, you hear something, and it just, it goes in. You click, you have your aha moment. Or maybe you've been inspired in your heart. You've felt an emotional connection. You've felt a certain drive to take yourself somewhere. And then after that uh-huh, after that conceptual, theoretical experience, life goes back to normal and you don't actually make any change. That it's this conceptual experience that stays in the mind or in the heart. So what are the feet for? The feet enable us to take the theoretical, to take those, oh, that's like an idea, that's who I want to be in the world, and bring it into the world of action. So here's the amazing thing. If we start using our feet, if we start moving in our lives, if we start even dancing, we lift the values in our hearts. We lift our conceptual selves higher. When we use our feet and we move in our lives, we decide, I want to be this kind of person. I want to take these ideas and live them. We actually lift those parts of ourselves higher up and we bring it with us. We have a holistic experience of ourselves. We're not compartmentalized. My heart feels one thing, my mind feels another. When we connect all three, we become a whole self. So this is the opportunity and this is really the challenge. Because there are often times that we want to act in a certain way and our mind or our heart isn't exactly there. Shlomo HaMelech tells us in Mishlei and Proverbs that a wise woman, sorry, that the wisdom of women builds their homes. 
And the foolish woman destroys her home with her hands. Okay, so let's take this apart. The wisdom of women builds their homes. What do we mean that the wisdom of women builds their homes? Have you ever had an amazing idea and thought it and then a structure has come into being? No? Okay, me neither. So, so we have to think about this. First of all, if the wisdom of women builds homes, we're not talking about a physical structure, a house. What do we mean when we say home? What comes to mind when, when you hear the word home? Um, Family, yeah? Anyone else? A safe place. A safe place, okay. Kitchen. Your kitchen, okay, yes, everyone's over and everyone's all in the kitchen, right? But there's a feeling there, right? There's, I, I heard words about connection, about safety, of protection. So what we're building is not a physical structure. Okay, so we've already established that. So what do we mean the wisdom of women builds homes? When we refer to wisdom, what we mean is a certain connectedness in our knowing self, a certain realization that whatever I do in my building work, in myself, is not done alone. What does a wise woman know? She knows that no matter how much she runs around, she builds, she accomplishes, no matter how many to-do things on your list you check off, no matter how you accomplish in work, family, community, life, we don't do it alone. When we have that clarity, when we realize whatever I do, I do in partnership with my creator, then we build. Because we know I put in maximal effort, but I'm not doing this alone. I try to learn the steps, but God, you're the one who's going to help me leap across that straight stage or give me the opportunity to deal with having some clumsy feet. Either way, I'm not doing this alone. So if wisdom and that realization builds homes, then let's look at the flip side. What did we say? The foolish woman destroys her home with her hands. You would think that actually the second half of our verse would say that a woman who doesn't have wisdom would destroy her home. Right? So why is it the hands that destroy homes? What we're referring here to here are actions devoid of that realization. When I run through my life building and doing and using my hands, but I think it's all on me, 100%. I'm the one who has to get this job done, beginning, middle, and end, and I'm alone, then we're destroying our reality. So that Shlomo Melech, King Solomon, is telling us that in this world, it is about action. It is about using our hands. It is about being builders and dreamers and doers. But it's about doing so with the consciousness that I'm not doing this alone. That my efforts only find their actualization in this world when I realize God is always partnering with me. Now, this sounds very nice. I think it sounds nice. It's comforting to me. But the real challenge is putting this into action. We can sit here, as I said, we can have these insights, but what's going to happen when we walk out that door? Who are we going to be? Our power as women is to act in this world with that sense of connectedness. But it means that our challenge is also going to be that we can act in this world and we can do and we can build in a deep place of disconnection, fear, anxiety. So our work is going to be to change that perspective somehow. If we can move on that spectrum, right, from the clumsy girl in the ballet class to leaping across the stage, we're going to need to work to get ourselves constantly back towards that place of feeling connected and joyful. And the perspective that we have is going to have a ripple effect on the people around us. I kind of think about a woman's mood as like a spiritual Febreze, right? So you know those Febreze ads, right? Like there's this poof, right? And you see it sort of these molecules scatter into the room. But you know when you walk into the house and mom or your sister or your daughter, one of the women in the home, is in a bad mood. Yeah, okay. Nobody has to say anything, right? It's those little poofs of the mood. It's the poof of, this is how I'm feeling about my life. This is how I'm feeling about myself. And that affects everyone and everything around us. So if that's the case, it means we're pretty powerful. It means it's a big responsibility. 
There's a famous story that's told, it's one of my favorite stories, about Reb Zusha and Reb Eli Melech of Luzhensk. So Reb Zusha and Reb Eli Melech of Luzhensk were two brothers. And they, were, they used to travel, putting themselves into exile. So why would they do this? They wanted to experience what it was like to be completely dependent on the Almighty. Anyone who's traveled, I don't know, backpacked across Europe for five on $5 a day might be able to relate to this experience. So they would travel along in Eastern Europe. And the story goes that one time they were traveling with a group of vagabonds. I have to say, every time I tell this story, I kind of wonder what exactly a vagabond is. But they're traveling along with a group of vagabonds. They must have been labeled as such. And as they're traveling, the Russian police come and arrest them. Why? Some of this group are accused of, of being thieves, of stealing. And so because they're all traveling together as a group, they're all thrown into a Russian prison cell together. Now, Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech are very calm. They know they're innocent. They trust. Okay, we'll wait it out. We'll sit here for a bit. And soon we'll be released. And they're calmly sitting there. Now, you have to imagine, I don't know if anyone watches TV shows that show prisons, yes, okay? So you just have to imagine that whatever we have seen, that a Russian prison back in the 1800s was probably even worse. There was no ensuite bathroom. Everybody is all together in this room. They have a bucket in the middle of the cell to relieve themselves. Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech are sitting there calmly. But as time begins to pass, they realize the sun is setting. And Rav Eli Melech begins to be quite concerned. And he starts to realize it's time to daven mincha. It's time for me to pray the afternoon prayer service. So as he's sitting there, he's looking, he's looking out, he's realizing it's getting dark. What are we going to do? And he begins to cry. And Rav Zusha turns to Rav Eli Melech and he says, what's going on? Why are you crying? And he says to him, I see that we have a mitzvah, we have a commandment, we have an opportunity to connect to our Creator, it's going to be mincha, and I can't pray. I can't connect to my Creator. And Reb Zusha turns to Rav Eli Melech and he says to him, don't you see the very same God who gave you the mitzvah to pray, the very same Creator who said, this is how I want to have a relationship with you, Put that bucket in the middle of this room. Now, a bucket in the middle of a room, a bathroom, is a place that a person cannot pray. And Rav Ali Melech was crying because he realized he was going to be prevented from doing what he wanted to do. But what was Reb Zusha pointing out to him? You think that bucket is standing in your way because you think you have an agenda. You think that there is this way that you need to be living your life. There's a way that God wants something from you, and this bucket is in the way. But don't you see the very same creator who asked you to do A put the barrier of B in your way, which means that right now, God doesn't want you to pray mincha. And in that moment, Rav Eli Melech turns to Rav Zusha and he wipes away his tears because he realizes it's true. In this moment, I can see exactly what is wanted from me. And the two get up and they join hands and they begin to sing and dance. Why? Because there's nothing so sweet. There's nothing so delicious as clarity. As knowing this is what I'm supposed to be doing in this moment. And as they're singing and dancing, the Russian prison guard down the hall hears them. And he comes to check in on the cell, like, what's going on here? Singing and dancing in the prison cell? Aren't they supposed to be upset? And he barges in and he sees the scene, these two Hasidim singing and dancing. And he turns to one of the other prisoners and he says, what's going on? And the guy shrugs his shoulders. He says, I don't know. I didn't understand what they were saying in Yiddish. But all I can tell you is they were waving their hands around, they were speaking quite enthusiastically, and they were pointing at that bucket in the middle of the room. And the prison guard looks at the two of them dancing, and he looks at the bucket and he says, well, you're not going to have any cause to sing or dance now. And he picks the bucket up and <laughs> takes it out of the cell. So much of the time, we think that that person, that job we do have or don't have yet, that relationship that is or isn't working out, that kid, is the thing that's the bucket in the middle of our prison cell. And we think if only that thing weren't there, then I could sing and dance. 
Then I could be the person I want to be. Then I could live the life that I meant to live, that God, you wanted for me. What do we see here? It's the ability to look at those things in the middle of our self-constructed prison cells and see that's actually my cause to dance that shifts our perspective, that enables us to have cause to act, to sing, to dance wherever we are in our lives. I remember the spiritual Febreze. So we walk into a room, we walk into a house, and we feel all that stress. We feel all that angst or anxiety. And we look at it like that bucket, and we think, I, I, I can't. When that passes, when, when this changes, then I'll be able to do what I'm supposed to do. But what do we see? What's the game changer? Not the removal of the bucket, the shift of our perspective. Now, again, this is not easily done. And if you remember, we started off by talking about these three parts of the self. We have the intellect, we have the heart, and we have the world of action. And that, I want to suggest, is actually the most powerful way that we can shift our perspective, that we can build more joy in our lives and we can feel freer to sing and dance no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Is anyone here a rugby fan? Okay, me neither. <laughs> but... I do happen to know of one of the rituals of the New Zealand Blacks. So the New Zealand Blacks are the national rugby team in New Zealand. And one of their traditions, actually a, a very special tradition, is that before every rugby match, they do something called the haka. Has anyone seen the haka ever? I actually saw it a few years ago in person when I was in New York at the, at the museum. So the haka is the tribal dance of the Maori people, the native people of New Zealand. And it's, it's a very um, involved tribal dance, we'll say. If you've ever seen it, I'm not going to uh, do an impression for you now. They, their eyes bulge, their tongues stick out, they, they gesticulate, they get very loud. And this is one of their dances. Now, the New Zealand blacks have appropriated this as something that they do before every one of their rugby matches. So you can imagine if you're like the opponent from the UK, right? Here you are standing, about to play, and here they are doing this tribal dance before you start your match. And I really, I suggest you Google it or look it up on YouTube. It is really something to see. Now, as the New Zealand blacks are engaged in this haka, and there, there are chants, and there's a leader, and their arms are going, and their faces are going, at one level, they certainly are expressing something to their opponents. But who do you think they are making a greater impression on? Their opponents or themselves? Themselves. When they take on those warrior poses, when they become expansive in their bodies, however scared they may feel, they shape their internal reality. As they step on to the playing field, they do the haka not for the crowds, not for the other players, but for themselves. Because they know the truth that the Torah is telling us, that sometimes your head might be very busy, most of the time, right? That many times our hearts might be pulled in different directions, our emotions might be boiling. But when we use our feet, when we step into the world of action, we actually can shape ourselves from the outside in. When they do the haka, it's also not a solo performance. They don't go out onto the field one at a time and do their thing. They do it together which clearly communicates that when we are shaping ourselves, when we're working on ourselves, when we're trying to shift our perspective, when we see that bucket in the middle of the room of our life, we don't do it alone. And this concept of what it is to be together, to move together, is very much a Jewish concept. I remember the first time that I went to an Orthodox Jewish wedding. So I walked in, and someone greeted me, and I... I I wasn't related to, to the bride and groom. And they came up to me and they said, Mazel Tov. And I said to them, oh no, like, I'm, I'm not related. And they said to me, no, no, we say Mazel Tov to everybody. Why? Because when a new Jewish union forms, when there is a new Jewish home in Klal Yisrael, in the Jewish people, it's a Mazel Tov for all of us. This belongs to all of us. This is not privilege to, to the head table or those three tables out of the family. This is the joy that belongs to each and every one of us. And then comes the dancing. And how do we dance? 
we hold hands and we go around in a circle. And who in that circle is closer to the middle? This is basic geometry, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? We are all equidistant to the center in that circle. There is no privilege. There is no I am better. We all are in this as one. And when we move our feet in that way, some of those barriers begin to dissolve because we realize that wherever I am on that spectrum, right, the clumsy days, the graceful days, the connected times, the anxious times, we have equal access to shifting our reality, to moving in our perspective closer to the feeling of, I can do this. I can be that kind of a woman who builds my home, who builds my reality from a place of wisdom, from a place of connectedness. Now, this is not unique to, to the Jewish people. Right? We see this, if you look at any tribal practices, that this idea of dancing in a group, of linking hands, of transcending the barrier of self into other is practiced in many cultures. And the Zulu people have a word for this. They call it Ubuntu. Now, it is oftentimes translated as community, that there's this experience of community when we move together. But Rabbi Tzvi Friedman points out that actually that's a very poor translation because it fails to convey a much deeper concept that the Zulu are speaking about when they refer to Ubuntu. He says as follows, he says that community here, or Ubuntu, means I am because we are. We are because I am. And when you see that circle going around and around, what's its destination? Nowhere, right? It's not a conga line. It's a circle where we are stating, I'm simply showing up where I am. And I have permission to be where I am in the world of action and in myself, regardless of where I am stepping in that circle. You know, there is no greater joy, as I said, than clarity. We have a teaching that says that there is no joy like the resolution of doubts. Ain simcha ka'ataras hasfekot. That when we lose that doubt, when we realize, oh, that's what it was, or that's who I am or this is where I belong in this equation, that there is a deep, deep experience of joy. And I think if we look at this, this idea of stepping out of the world of just conceptual thinking and actually realizing that doing is one of the most powerful ways that we can affect change and joy in ourselves and with each other, we can see that when we link hands, when we, when we move into that circle, the joy is that aha moment of I'm me and you're you and and we can do this. And certainly that is the empowerment that the, that the New Zealand blacks experience on that field when they're doing the haka. Now we started off by saying we wanted to have a bit of a new angle on joy. I think a lot of the time we think that joy is this emotion, that it's going to come because of some external experience, or if I just think my way there, right? If I just have the right kind of gratitude, the right kind of perspective, then I will get myself to that place of happiness. But perhaps what we see is that a much more powerful way is not just to try to train our minds or our hearts, but it's to actually pick up our feet, to move in our lives, to take the ideas that we have of the kind of women we want to be, the ways we would like to grow, and put them into the world of action. Dance, if you will, on the stage of our lives. Now we, as Jewish women, have a legacy of doing this, and have a legacy of doing so when it might seem kind of irrational. So what am I referring to? So now we're kind of fast forwarding. I said Rosh Chodesh Adar, we're getting close to Purim, but soon it's going to be Pesach also. Don't, you know, be mad at me for mentioning that. <laughs> so we have the story of the exodus from Mitzrayim. We're leaving Egypt. What are we told? We didn't even have enough time for the bread to rise, right? We were leaving, and as Jewish women, we didn't even pack snacks. I'm telling you, I live like maybe five minutes away from here. I have snacks in my car. Right? There, we don't leave home without making sure there's at least something for us or someone else. We literally left without time for the dough to rise. Okay. We leave Egypt. We travel. And it doesn't go so simply. We come to the Yamsuf, to the Reed Sea. 
And there we are, and we're standing at the Reed Sea, and there's water in front of us, and the Egyptian army is behind us, and things don't look so good. And then what happens? God performs a miracle for us. The sea splits, and we know that we as a people walk through the Yam Suf, through the Reed Sea, walls of water on either side. And as we're walking through the sea, what do we do? We sing. And we're told that Miriam, the prophetess, leads the women in song. In song of gratitude, in song of clarity, it's, it's that ultimate aha moment, right? We thought it wasn't going to be okay. I didn't think I was going to make it, and wow, we're okay. And we're told that she led the women with musical instruments, that they had tambourines. Now, let's rewind, okay? They didn't have time for the bread to rise, okay? They didn't take snacks, but you're bringing a three-piece band? This should strike us as somewhat odd. But we're told that Miriam, even in the darkest, most narrow moments of Mitzrayim, even in the places in her life and the lives of our nation, knew that there would be a time when we would sing. What's that kind of knowing? That's the kind of knowing when everything looks bleak, when you have every reason to say, eh, not going to end well, I'm giving up. It's the ability to say, no, right now this looks really bad. But we're packing tambourines because I know and I trust that someday we will have cause to sing. There will be reason to dance. And she leads the women because they've brought their tambourines. But here's the thing. Does she wait until they've crossed the other side of the Yamsuf? Are they all done? Is it like, okay, whew, God, we thought it was going to be really bad. Really, really not going to end well. And now you made it all, all right. No. The Jewish women sing, we're told, betoch hayam. They are still standing on that seabed. Walls of water on either side. They are not at the end of the story. This is not, you know, like the three kids have graduated, you've married them off, and you know it's all going to be okay. This is, I am still in the middle of my story. I still have that bucket in the middle of this room. But you know what? I'm going to sing right now. So that at the first level, what Miriam teaches us is that we bring our tambourines with us, that even in the darkness we know I'm going to be able to sing and to dance. But she also teaches us that even in the midst of the experience, even when the light is coming, but we're not totally sure the darkness is gone, we sing and we dance and we give thanks. I imagine the women leaving Egypt. I imagine the days when there was no sign of hope yet. And I imagine them carrying those tambourines, knowing that they have actually with them something physical because they are the kinds of women who build with wisdom. That even if the world says, no, 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 no point in that. You're going to live that way? You're going to make those changes in your life? Sorry, what? You're keeping Shabbat? You're leaving work early? You're doing what with your kids in schooling? We had our tambourines. Because we knew that even when all seemed hopeless, there would be reason. And if I imagine carrying that tambourine as a source of hope, as a source of clarity, as a source of permission to dance in our lives, to, to move with purpose, to do our own kind of haka that says, yes, I can do this. I think my greatest role model in this was my booby of blessed memory. My booby was born in Ludge, Poland. She lost her mother at the age of five. She was the youngest of six children, and she always described herself as the apple of her father's eye. So I can only imagine the trauma in her early 20s when she held his hand as he died in the Ludge ghetto. She went on to survive the camps and then met my Zadie, who she had actually known from Ludge before the war, in a DP camp in Linz, Austria. And somehow, a woman who had lost almost everything, like so many survivors, was able to hope, was able to begin again. They got married. They had my mother. My booby gave birth to my mother in Linz, Austria, in the DP camp. 
And when, they, when my mother was six months old in 19, I don't know if I should say how, anyway, when my mother was an infant, <laughs> they, took, they took a boat over to Canada. And I remember my mother always saying to us, or my booby always saying, how they came without a penny in her pocket and without a word of English. And they built a new life. They built a home based on wisdom. They had a family. And I always remember my booby referring to their marriage between my booby and my Zadie as a, as a shidduch, a match made in heaven. She was an incredibly devoted wife. And so when I was 12 years old and my Zadie passed away, I remember the feeling of not really knowing if this was a woman who could go on in his absence. And to be honest with you, I think she had the same question for herself. So it was quite amazing to watch for 20 years as she not only survived, but thrived. She would go to lectures, she made new friends, her family was the greatest source of her joy. But she let us know that this was not always so easy. And she would say to us, you know, there are many days that I wake up, and you think I want to get up? You think I want to get out of bed? Her back hurt, her knee hurt, her heart hurt. But she would say, you know what? I get myself up. I take a hot shower. I get dressed. And then she would tell us, because my outer actions contradict my inner feelings. And then she would tell us, and before I go out, I always put on my lipstick. And I have to tell you, this is true. Because I have to like what I see. We have to like who we are. Sometimes our outer actions will contradict our inner feelings. We will have the moments where we feel like that clumsy girl in the ballet class. And we'll think, really? I'm not leaping across any stages today. We will look at the buckets in our life, that problem, that challenge, that person, and we will think, when that leaves, then I can dance. But what do we know? Our most powerful tool, our greatest potential for experiencing more joy, for being the kind of women we want to be, the kind of women we know we can be, the kind of women who carry those tambourines even in the darkness, is how we act, is how we dance, is how we move. So if this all sounds very conceptual and you're not much of a dancer, I'll leave you with this thought. What my booby did was she put on lipstick. She didn't change the world overnight. She didn't think that it was her job to fix everything and everyone or even everything in herself. But she did one small act because that small act made her feel like the bigger things were possible. So if I leave you with one thing, one idea about how to expand your joy today, about how to live more joyfully as women and spread that spiritual Febreze in our lives and in our relationships, it's this. Find one small way your own maybe personal haka, to carry your heart, to carry your mind with your feet in your life. Find one small act that will allow you to feel that expansiveness and that joy. And then, I don't know if we're going to be Billy Elliot, but we might just leap across the stage of our life. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions?